We are continuing with the colonial evolution, this time talking about uh, the evolution of religion. We know that the original Puritans um, who came over believed that they had a contract with God to create a city set on a hill, which by that they meant an example of a purified church for the rest of the world to see. But as time wore on, first and second generations, passions of the originals began to cool. Now, don't get me wrong, religion was still very much a part of their life, very significant. But they had lost some of that zeal um, and some of the passion of the originals who came over. They were busy surviving in the wilderness, uh, making homes, creating businesses. Uh, second and third generations are at work making America successful. Now, all colonists supported what we could call a state church. Every colony had a church that was supported through taxes. All 13 colonies. People were taxed to support the clergy and to keep the church uh, maintenance. Attendance, now catch this, attendance was required. In fact, in Virginia, in the um, minutes of the Colonial Assembly, the House of Burgesses, there was a law passed that if you miss church three times in a row, you receive the death sentence. That's not the Puritans. Those are the Anglicans. And of course, church attendance was also crucial in New England, in the Puritan colonies. But as time progressed, uh, and those passions began to cool, church services were more about appealing to the intellect rather than to the passions, to the heart. Going to church became more a matter of tradition and compulsion, because you had to go. If you're a businessman and you want to keep your clientele, you're, they're going to see you at church. So church is compulsory. Sermons delivered uh, what could be called learned discourses. In other words, uh, they used the Bible, they used scripture, but they also brought in the newest information about science, literature, politics. So it was to appeal to the mind of the colonists. Congregations were divided by social class. I have on this next slide a photograph of the North Church in Boston. I took this photograph the first time I visited Boston. And last summer, when my daughter and daughter-in-law and I went to Boston, we also visited this. This is the North Church in Boston. It's the church where a Longfellow wrote his poem about uh, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. We were put to put a lantern in the bell tower. One if, if the British were coming by land, two if they were coming by sea. But what I want you to notice about this photograph is there are no pews, no benches that you can see. What you see are boxes. Uh, if you look, the the black spots you see are hinges because every box has a door and the box belonged to families in Boston. You bought the box. You could furnish it however you wanted to. Rocking chairs, easy chairs, however you wanted to furnish it and it was yours. When you were not there, you locked the door. Everything would be just as you left it the next time you come to church. As you can see, the minister had to climb a set of stairs to get up to the pulpit. So it was really only the minister that could see into the boxes. Otherwise, you're pretty private as you attend church and you sit in your family box. So you had to have money. You had to be a prominent family. 
to own one of these boxes. The less your status in society, the further back in church you sat. So in the very back of the church, there were open pews for people who could not afford uh, to buy a box. So congregations were divided by social and economic class. Until in the 1730s, 1740s, a religious movement spread across the land through all 13 colonies. Historians have called it the Great Awakening. It was a time of religious revival and evangelism. Emotion-based expression of religion. This time, you, it is the spirit of man that is touched. It is the heart, uh, the passions that are appealed to in this religious revival, this religious movement. We could talk quite a bit about uh, the preaching, teaching uh, that took place during the Great Awakening under men such as George Whitefield, who was an Anglican minister. You, you see his picture there on the slide. He was uh, an Anglican minister in England, and he traveled across the Atlantic to the southern colonies and began preaching his way north through the colonies all the way up to the New England colonies. What I want to remember for our purposes in talking about the evolution of the colonies is that this movement challenged the traditional authority of the clergy. And keep in mind, the clergy are, they're the same ones, who, they are the religious authority, they're also civil authority. So if you challenge to, to the traditional authority of the clergy, it's not a big step to challenge the authority of parliament. So the Great Awakening, this first Great Awakening, has revolutionary aspects. It is helping to prepare Americans to challenge traditional authority. There's an image at the bottom of this slide uh, that shows one of the Enlightenment preachers standing on a tree stump, uh, preaching to whoever assembles there around the town well. So this essentially is the center of town. And you can see in that image all different levels of society. So in the Great Awakening, there is a leveling of the influence in society. That is, the wealthy uh, can attend these revival meetings side by side with servants, with the poor class. Uh, in the image, you can see a man sitting down, looks like he's probably a slave, sitting in the foreground. Um, you can see the blacksmith there in front of his shop, an organ grinder there on the left, uh, some gentlemen sitting on some steps on the right, men and women. So it was, an, a, it was ending this division of social classes in church. Now, not everybody supported the Great Awakening. Some of the traditional ministers uh, were adamantly opposed to it. And in, in fact, these uh, Enlightenment ministers usually were not allowed to preach inside churches because the traditional clergy didn't approve of them. So they preached wherever they could get a crowd together. On the next slide, uh, there's an image there of Jonathan Edwards, a Puritan minister, actually fourth generation Puritan minister. Uh, he taught the famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Some of you may be aware of it. It used to be taught in literature classes in high school, in public schools. Remember, Puritans believed in predestination, that your fate, your destiny was determined before you were ever born, and there wasn't anything you could do to change your destiny. But Jonathan Edwards stepping outside of that accepted Puritan or Calvinist doctrine, he preaches that sinners are like this spider that's hanging from a thin strand 
of the spider web over the abyss, over the pits of hell. And he said, unless you repent, God is going to snip that thread and you're going to fall into the pits of hell. So he is offering people an opportunity to change their destiny. That was a big thing. That was totally outside the parameters of Calvinist teachings, of Puritan belief structure. And they say about Jonathan Edwards that when he preached about hellfire and brimstone, you could smell the stench and you could feel the heat. He was so charismatic in his speaking. There was also uh, Gilbert Tennant, his image is there on the slide. He was a Presbyterian minister and uh, he became part of the Great Awakening. Also, the big image there is of one of these ministers preaching to a crowd gathered on a hillside. So if they couldn't meet inside the churches, they met wherever they could get a group together, whether it was in a field, on the hillside, in a barn, um, wherever they could get a group together. This Great Awakening, again, played a large part in helping to form the American mind, which we're going to talk about next, to lead Americans toward revolution. Sometime after the American Revolution, someone asked John Adams about the revolution. And his response was, quote, What do we mean by the American Revolution? Do we mean the American War? The revolution was effected before the war commenced. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. A change in their religious sentiments of their duties and obligations. This radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affection of the people was the real American Revolution." Unquote. John Adams knew what he was talking about. He was one of the most passionate patriots, uh, one of the most the strongest advocates for independence. I want to talk now about forming the American mind. We talked about education, we talked about colleges, books, newspapers, and so on. So what were the ideas and where did they come from? Some came from classical education, the ancient Greeks and Romans, from which Americans learned respect for lessons from history. They learned from the Greeks and Romans about the best forms of government. Greeks and Romans like Cato, Cicero, Aristotle, Plato, taught the value of wisdom and virtue. And the virtue they talked about was not moral virtue, but civic virtue. That is the individual's responsibility to make sure that life was good for everybody. Civic virtue, take your responsibility. They also, Americans also, uh, their ideas, their principles were shaped by the Enlightenment, an intellectual movement that swept across France and spread through Europe to England and to America. They were influenced by philosophers such as John Locke, who taught that liberty and justice were the natural rights of mankind, that man created government to protect those rights. And if a government did not protect those rights, it was a corrupt government and should be abolished. They learned from Montesquieu, a Frenchman who wrote a little book called Spirit of the Laws. For Montesquieu, they learned that the best form of government has three branches and that it has checks and balances built in to that form of government. Cato's letters, which were a series of letters published anonymously in London newspapers, liberal thought, people in Britain, actually written by two men, um, John, John Gordon, John Trenchard, and his name has eluded me, Trenchard and Gordon, that was the two last names. And in those letters that, the, that were published in the newspaper, signed Cato's letters, they said, without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom. 
and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech, unquote. Also, they said, quote, the Romans preserved their liberty by limiting the time and power of their magistrates and by making them answerable afterwards for their behavior in it. Another a little pamphlet that was published in America uh, during the 1770s called Common Sense argued for independence from England. This was written by a man named Thomas Paine, a newly immigrated to America from England. He was very opposed to the corrupt government in England, and he championed the cause of creating a democratic republic in America. So those were the elements, those were the influences that helped to shape the American mind in the days before and leading up to the revolution. To finish out colonial evolution, I want to talk a little bit about society, about immigration. Uh, between the 1670s and the 1760s, most of the immigrants uh, who went to New England were prosperous, middle-class families. Now, later in the 1700s, immigration from England slows down. There are also a large number of Scots immigrating and settling on the frontier lines, especially Pennsylvania frontier. Uh, in fact, there were 145,000 Scots that immigrated to Pennsylvania and the surrounding area between 1700 and 1775. Scots-Irish, those were the Scots who had moved uh, during the 1600s to Northern Ireland. So their descendants were called Scots-Irish. They were Irish Protestants. They immigrate to the middle colonies and the frontier usually young men or young men and their, and their wives, single families. Also, during this time period, over 100,000 German family groups immigrated to Pennsylvania. In 1720, the population of the 13 colonies was 450,000. If you look at the map and the chart on this slide, uh, you'll see the different areas where these immigrants went to and uh, the number, the percentage of the population. The last slide, I thought you might find it interesting to look at the clothing of the colonists who lived during this time period. We'll look first at the men's clothing. Men would wear an undershirt, which would usually be made out of linen if he could afford it, otherwise wool. Then he had his knee breeches which will be made out of wool, and his knee-length stockings, also made out of wool. And of course, you see there their black shoes with the buckle. Their hair, they usually wore long and in a queue. Uh, for formal occasions, public appearance, they would wear wigs, as you can see in the image there. Also, they would wear uh, cravats, which would be yards and yards of starched material that they would wind around their neck and tie in all different kind of fanciful knots to finish off their, their attire. Then, of course, on, on top of the, the shirt, the pants, they had a waistcoat, also made out of wool, which uh, came down below the waist, buttoned up, and then over that, their coat also made out of wool. All of this was required for a man to be in public. Even in his own home, if there were guests, if there were visitors, he had to have all of this on or he was considered undressed. And that was very uncouth or rude. So the bottom image there under the men's clothing, uh, the man has on his cape, and his hat, which would have been a beaver hat, made out of beaver felt, uh, which I talk about on a podcast. But let's look at the women. Women had it no better than the men, perhaps a little worse. A woman who was 
above a certain age, which would be usually around 23, whether she was, even if she was unmarried, she had to wear a hat. If she was married, she would wear a hat. But wearing a hat when you were not married identified you as an old maid. Your dress would consist of a, we'll start over on the, on the right, with the stays. The stays, which was one of the most torturous articles of clothing, uh, a lot of times made out of very uh, rough, scratchy material with whale bone in it to provide the structure. And a woman would uh, wear that, usually over a shift, and the shift is pictured there next to the stay. Uh, and it would be laced up tight as they could get it. There were women in those days who suffered from broken ribs because of tight stays. Women who fainted because they couldn't get enough air in their lungs to breathe properly. So those stays, or corsets, if you will, uh, very much a required article of clothing for women, but also very painful and dangerous to a woman's health. So the shift usually had sleeves in it, up to the neck, down to the ankle. Over that, she would wear a petticoat, which would be yards and yards of material. And then the gown over that. And a lot of times, you would have a underskirt over the petticoat, and your dress would open down the front to show the underskirt. All of this is pounds of material. You can see the shoes. Pointed shoes, sometimes made out of silk, sometimes made out of soft leather. As I mentioned earlier, she had to wear a cap. If she went out in public, she wore a hat over the cap. So I have a couple of images of couples there. The black and white image is a more uh, social elite couple. The couple in color at the bottom would be more middle class. And then I have some pictures of children's clothing. And as you can see from the black and white image with the uh, father, the mother, and two children, they dress the children just like little adults with all of these, the petticoats, the stays, the, the shifts, the boys with their waistcoats, their overcoats, show some undershirts and some collars that babies wore there. So my point in all of this is to realize that when our founding fathers got together in the Continental Congress or um, when they were voting for independence, they were dressed in all of this heavy, hot clothing in buildings that were stifling hot in the first place because no air conditioning, no fans. Um, a lot of times they held their meetings in secret. They'd have all the windows closed, the door closed. So these, these men and women suffered discomfort in order to bring about what we celebrate today as our independence and our revolution. So this ends the series on England and America. The next uh, series will be on Americans standing on principle. See you next time. Don't forget, uh, check out the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, they are also called History Bites. See you next time.